This is a Jazz Online special podcast, a conversation with Lyle Mays, celebrating the recording, the Ludwigsburg concert, featuring the Lyle Mays Quartet. I'm your host, Joseph Vela. So, Lyle, set the stage as to how this uh, recording came to be and what you were doing at the time. Well, it was uh, recorded in Ludwigsburg, Germany, in 93. I was on tour in Europe with my quartet, which was Mark Johnson on bass, Bob Shepard on tenor and alto and flute, and a young drummer named Mark Walker, who the world hadn't really heard of yet. But anyway, I didn't remember that this evening was recorded. So when the record company called me up, I was shocked to find that there was the mythical lost tapes in their possession and that they wanted to release it as a two-CD set and also digitally. I was a little ambivalent because my memory of live concerts or board tapes are that there's Always something you wish you could have done over. Always something where not everyone in the band was having a good night. Or me as a leader wasn't on my game. (laughs) Uh, Fumbling or stumbling or bumbling. or Anyway, I got the files and I started listening and I was shocked. Because every single band member had had a good night. And as a unit, we were playing the ensemble passages and the group improv sections like a veteran quartet that had been playing for years. They happened to catch us on the best night of a tour where we made no mistakes, but yet played with freedom and excitement and abandon. And uh, I was (laughs) just really excited because that never happens there's or so rarely happens there's usually something you like i said before that you want to do over again or something that's not mixed right or who knows but uh, not only did they capture that quartet on the best night of the tour but the recording engineer they had did such a good job that when bob rice went to remaster it he could just really bring out every little nuance of the live sound. He just did an astounding job. I really love the way the the CDs sound. What has been your process, though, in assembling musicians to play in an acoustic environment? Well, I started playing with Mark Johnson at North Texas, and I think that kind of set the stage. I just said, wow, this guy can play, and stopped asking questions. It's like, this guy's great. Okay, got a bass player, Uh, and on and on like that. I did a record with my old roommate from North Texas, Pat Coyle. He asked... uh, me to produce his Sheffield Lab recording, and I got Steve Rodby involved in that, and we co-produced it. But during those sessions, listening back to all the tapes, and this was a, this was going to be a direct to final session, so we had to listen to the various versions we had, because they were all cut into masters. It was a very different thing. We couldn't change anything after the fact. But I noticed that on every single take, on every single track, Bob Shepard played record-quality solos with imagination and perfection. It was like, okay, found a sax player. So it kind of went on like that. I didn't really have to search hard. I just kind of, when I heard someone who played great, I said, okay, that's a great musician. I've been lucky. First time I heard Mark Walker, he was playing with Steve Rodby. So 
Rodby made him sound amazing. And Mark made him sound amazing. So I said, okay, this guy can play with great bass players. How much rehearsal are you actually doing, though, for a tour like this? Uh, exactly one evening before the tour started. Uh, it was a very long and very intense rehearsal. But also as the tour went on, we would tweak things. In the afternoon at sound check, we might change something around or discuss during a train ride how to approach a certain freer section. But mostly with musicians of this caliber, uh, a word to the wise is sufficient. We were just talking uh, before we started about compositions, material. Mm. And you had a nice point about how uh, the, the music featured on your tour and also on the the recording is not just standards. It, Absolutely. It, it, could you talk a little bit about the the importance of that, number one, and, and how you approached picking the repertoire for the, the tour and, and the group? For the longest time, I think... Uh after fusion and a lot of musicians, a lot of jazz musicians were playing electric instruments, whenever they would do an all-acoustic set, there was a tendency to play standards, as if the style of acoustic jazz was written in stone and it stopped at some point in the 60s. And philosophically, I felt strongly that modern acoustic jazz didn't have to be locked into the tradition in terms of the style of the pieces. And I looked to Steve Swallow for inspiration because he wrote modern jazz tunes with a straight eight feel. It wasn't uh, hemmed in by swing or any other concerns. He was a composer finding his own voice, and it sounded very modern to me. So based off that, I tried to write... Uh, kind of my versions of Steve Swallow tunes for acoustic groups, but make it modern and stylistically diverse so we can use influences from South America or world music or classical music or whatever. I mean, jazz has always done that, in my opinion. So um, it was a pretty easy decision for me to not do standards because I'm a composer, so I have things I can draw from. And also you're doing uh, reinterpretations or re-impressions of tunes that you did with Pat Metheny Group in an acoustic setting with a semi-different arrangement, and that must have been somewhat freeing in a sense. Those were the hardest things, because we did a little bit of the piece, uh, Are We There Yet? And... Uh, that was done with about 20 tracks of synthesizers and overdubs, and it was really a studio piece. To reimagine that in an acoustic quartet was a challenge, but it did provide yet another stylistic opportunity for the quartet. So we sound more like the old Stevie Winwood traffic band on that little section. And it was, I felt good to be able to showcase the range of all these musicians. I mean, Bob Shepard's a great studio musician. He can play anything. All, all these guys, they can play anything. So I was glad to get that included. We just really opened up, and uh, the transitions between disbelief and are we there yet and ole gave opportunities for freer improvisation, sometimes a group improvisation. So there was an element of free jazz, but not so much that you need to turn it off. <laughs> Enough so that you could hear the interaction and the abilities of the quartet to play with no direction whatsoever. And then there's a solo piano kind of cadenza almost before Ole, or in the middle of Ole, I should say. 
And that was an opportunity for me to put whatever influences I wanted into it. And that night, it was more of the classical. That's one of the most interesting sections of the whole night, for my taste. into in circle, certain circles of music uh, fans in the electric sense of all the synth work and the, the, the layering mm. and the certain innovative approaches from just your keyboard playing. And, you know, people who know you know you started and you did a lot of things in a very traditional sense. And then the electric element came in and that became... 30 plus years playing that stuff and being having your own synth sound and and you're identified in in a certain uh, historical sense in that way but when you're playing in a quartet or a trio is it more freeing to just play the piano and 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 how does the approach if any differ in terms of what you're going to play how you're going to play it uh you know those those nuances Mm -hmm. well people know me for embracing electronics for good reason. Even on my solo piano record, I wanted to make the point that my instrument was really the MIDI piano or the acoustic piano combined with synthesizers. I'd done that all my adult career. So that's a a sort of an honest impression that people have. But the economics of this tour were such that I couldn't bring a synth tech, my whole rig, a semi-truck. I mean, it was just impossible. So I had to figure out a way to still satisfy my desire for orchestration, but with an all-acoustic group. So in that sense, from the design sense, it was more of a challenge. So the word liberation didn't come into my mind in preparing for the tour. It was more like Uh, an impossible challenge. But I think we addressed it with um, some careful discussions about uh, orchestrational variety, a mixture of ensemble playing and solo passages for me and different woodwinds for Bob and all the various stylistic things that Mark Walker can do. So we had that as a conscious issue in all of our minds, that that was something that we wanted to deal with, that we wanted to make the point that even though this was an acoustic quartet, we weren't going to sound the same on every minute of every piece. But then once we got that negotiated and rehearsed and comfortable, I did feel an enormous amount of freedom just playing the piano. It was kind of the first time in my life that I'd really just been the piano player. (laughs) So I got to feel that finally. But I was also a little nervous because that's not traditionally been my thing. So I think I've spent an extra amount of time just practicing the piano before this uh, tour started because I didn't want to embarrass myself. I think it's important for improvisational musicians to be selfless in terms of playing with their ensembles. Yeah, I was thinking about all of your albums, minus the solo improvisational album, and then now adding this uh, live quartet record in. You always let everybody play, and it happens in different spots. Everybody has a say in the story. 
Is that something that you emulated from people that you listened to before you were, while you were forming your own approach or? I think it comes more from listening to classical music and getting accustomed to variety and instruments used in ways that weren't always their traditional roles, where the bass didn't always have to play the lowest note in the arrangement or something. So I've always tried to look for orchestrational possibilities in the world of improvisation so that the, the players themselves can show that their own versatility. Do you approach other things in your life in the same manner as you do with your music? I think so. I think that my general philosophy is to dig as deeply as I can and understand as much as I can, talk about it, write about it, refine it. It's the opposite of the magical thinking that if you talk about your soloing, you'll ruin it because then the, the mind gets in the way. I'm more of the school of thought that says, get your mind engaged in as many ways as you can. It'll just enrich your playing. So I've never been afraid of getting analytical about music. But having said that, when it comes time to play, I have to rely on my instincts at that point. There's not time. When you're improvising jazz, especially at a higher level with some challenges, you don't have any time to think about what you're doing. You have to deliver so I think the prep work of looking at all these aspects of music, making them very apparent and understood in my own brain, gives me the ability to then let that come out in the moment. It's almost like we're not born with musical instincts. We have to create them. And everything we listen to and all the ways we think about music are the way that we can actually develop musical instincts. So it's, uh, without getting too much more philosophical, that's kind of my general approach. Do you think you'd be a different player if you had access to the amount of music and information that is now available for people or for, for stu- music students? Like, because Good question. <laughs> I might be overwhelmed. might have taken me another 10 years to feel the confidence to put out a record or something. As it was, I waited eight years after Manfred Eicher invited me to make a record before I made my first solo record because I wasn't ready. And was that a good experience for you? Was it, when you look back on it now, was it the right time? Did you select the right material? Are you happy with how you played? I'm so glad I waited because that record may be my favorite or one of my favorites. It's considered by some people to be almost a classic of sorts. And I wish they would have thought that at the time. It took a long time for that record to find its audience. But I stand behind it now. I'm very proud of how it was done. Again, the compositional integrity of it, the variety of it, the players I chose. So I'm very glad I waited. You've played so many concerts in your career. When do you know when you have an audience? When do you know when you need to maybe win the audience or or bring them into you? Well, I think I've been really lucky. I suppose in the very early days of the PMG, uh, no one knew who we were. And we didn't know who we were. We didn't really have our sound together and our flow together and all kinds of things. But it came together very quickly. And from that point on, I kind of can't remember ever having to win an audience over. It's like the reputation preceded us. And that uh, sort of followed me into doing this tour where 
jazz fans in Europe especially are pretty savvy and they know who musicians are and they know their history and they're there to hear what you have to say. So it's a very uh, positive energy right off the start. But I also try to pick pieces that can match the energy at the start of a concert so that there's a symbiosis there. But you're aware of a narrative in the sequencing of the tunes, Right? I mean, in a sense, you're actually still trying to keep people, I know, I hate to use the word entertained, Well, b- b- but I, I mean it in the sense of y- you are telling a story musically and you're also, you're trying to work it internally on the bandstand, but at the same time, you also want it to be enjoyable for people, so it's not a, just a, a bunch of musicians enjoying themselves. Yeah, kind of. that's a great point. And I think one of the things that jazz musicians tend to lose sight of are other elements of music besides melody, harmony, and rhythm. And I don't look at uh, improvisation as a way for me to express myself. I think that everything I present on stage, the compositions, the arrangements, all those things are part of my musical personality and my voice. I just don't, I don't wait for a solo to feel like, oh, now I get to express myself. By that same token, one of the things I do want to express is that the old jam session form of head, solo, 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 bass solo, drum solo, out head, gets so old and boring for the audience so quickly. Even with master players, I want to hear more variety. I don't like music that just dispenses with a whole category of music, or a whole dimension, I should say, of music. We were taught that music has three dimensions from an early age, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And I simply ask the question, what if it's a 10-dimensional musical world? What if orchestration is equally important? What if drama is equally important? So I have a whole list of other elements to music that I'm trying to think about all the time to make the music more multidimensional. That has the added benefit of, you use the word entertaining, That's one aspect of it. I think it makes the music more accessible in a general sense, even if it's really deep and complex and serious. If it has a dramatic arc to it, if people can relate to whatever story they're making in their own heads as they're listening to the music, that helps them just appreciate what's going on or feel more a part of it. So my approach, I guess, is to engage the audience without any condescension, without any simplification of any element of the music, but just by crafting it with enough care and completeness that it's easier for people to find their way in. Talk a little bit about collaboration. Well, I've always been a fan of collaboration. And I think as time marches on, collaboration is maybe the only way to achieve anything, both in science or the arts or you name it. Just simply because there's so much information out there and so much more that you have to learn as a young person before you start finding your own voice you kind of need help. There's just too much to master these days in kind of any field. But I started collaborating with with Mark Johnson when we were in college together at NTSU. So we kind of got to know each other over the course of decades. So doing some duet passage with Mark is effortless. We've just found our vocabulary and, and It's like a quarterback and a receiver. We've run the route so much that we're on the same page. And uh, I think because of Bob's background as a session musician, it was um, pretty easy to to harness his versatility and, and find things that we could do together. And I think you hear the collaboration 
almost developing in real time during the transition from disbelief to are we there yet? Because every night we would do a completely different free piece as that transition. And so one of the benefits of a live recording is that you get to actually hear in real time the neurons firing, the people feeling each other out, the growth actually happening in front of your eyes, or your ears in this case. I think a lot of people will be surprised how great Mark Walker sounds. The first time I played with Mark Walker, he was calling out chord changes to the bass player as they were jamming on some tune. I went, that's a musician. (laughs) That's the kind of drummer I want. Um, But uh, this was kind of the first time that, or one of the first times that Mark actually got to do a tour with the A-list players. So I got to watch kind of a rookie have a rookie of the year season. It was just thrilling to me. And I didn't have to say much to Mark. He tells a story that I don't remember happening. He says that after one of our first rehearsals, I told him he didn't need to put a cymbal crash every eight bars on one, that he was playing with me and Mark Johnson, and I assured him we knew where we were in the form. That's the way he tells it. Uh, I'll take his word. I don't remember saying it. But one kind of suggestion like that to someone as smart and savvy as Mark Walker is all it takes. The rest was just getting to see him blossom into a more mature, more artistic, more confident version of himself. Because he had all the tools. He didn't need to learn anything new. He mainly, I think, just needed the setting to shine. That's an interesting point, though, because in the world of jazz or improvised music, that brotherly help and inspiration seems to be passed down, you know, decade to decade, generation to generation. How important is that, actually? Oh, it's so important to me. I mean, I think Stan Getz won Record of the Year in 1964, and... The Stan Getz record I had had this young vibraphonist named Gary Burton on it. And then this guitar player, who was the first major musician I got to play with, was Pat Metheny, who had played with this vibraphonist, and and on and on. So the lineage keeps going. And I was really happy to give a young, deserving monster an opportunity to grow into that and to have the experience of going on the road with some older, more experienced cats. Are there a few moments that were just extra dynamic and still excite you? Well, my personal favorite is the first track on the first CD. And I I switched the tunes a little bit from the order we did them in concert because Hard Eights is what we were opening with. And that's a good tune to warm up with. But on Fictionary, I had hit my stride. I was very comfortable, had no monitor issues. I was used to the room and the audience. And I think I stretched out more on that intro that night than I had done the rest of the tour. But I think that particular track showcases my ability to play solo piano, my ability to comp and interact with the acoustic quartet, and then to solo on changes in that jazz tradition. So it kind of covers the whole spectrum just in one piece. But it's like a 23 or 4 minute piece, so it's not like a single.
Conversation with Lyle Mays is a Jazz Online original production. For more information, visit jazzonline.com. I'm Joseph Vela. Thanks for listening.